this one is called The Art of Political Engagement, and I'm happy about all the panels, but I'm, I'm always happy to have an opportunity to listen to uh, people that are great at things I can't do, which is um, really having boots on the ground, reporting experience, and writing about current events in a way that's meaningful and lasting. So what I'd like to do uh, with these gentlemen, I'm gonna introduce each of them. They're gonna read a section from their uh, latest books, and then we're gonna have a Q&A, and I definitely hope there's some good audience interaction as well. So uh, to my immediate left is Douglas Rogers. Douglas is an award-winning author, travel writer, and journalist with 18 years experience writing for the world's leading magazines and newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Travel and Leisure, National Geographic Traveler, The Guardian, Daily Telegraph, and Times of London. Born and raised in Zimbabwe, he's lived in Johannesburg, London, New York, and Virginia, and has reported for more than 50 countries on topics as diverse as the diamond trade in Africa, the movie stars of Bollywood, and the restaurants of New Orleans. His most recent book is Two Weeks in November, the astonishing untold story of the operation that toppled Mugabe, a nonfiction political thriller about the perfect coup that toppled the world's longest reigning dictator. Hailed by Rian Milan as, quote, some of the hottest nonfiction I've ever read, and by the Times of London as comic and terrifying, told with dark humor, political understanding, and narrative flair. It was a BBC Radio 4's Book of the Week. And to his left is Tom Capsidelis. Tom is a longtime Virginia journalist and author of After Virginia Tech, Guns, Safety, and Healing in the Era of Mass Shootings, published in April 2019 by the University of Virginia Press. He was an editor for 28 years at the Richmond Times-Dispatch before accepting a fellowship in 2016 at Virginia Humanities to complete work on his book. He also worked at United Press International and the State of Columbia, South Carolina. Tom's a graduate of the University of Maryland and the MFA program in creative nonfiction at Goucher College. Please join me in welcoming uh, Douglas and Tom. Yep, so um, uh, I think we're gonna start by reading um, part of a book. Uh, I'm actually gonna, I won't read, but I'm gonna give you an introduction to how I came to write the book, and um, you could read the introduction if you, if you buy it, obviously, but uh, it'll give you a bit of an understanding of what the book's about. Um, first of all, I should probably say, well, obviously, thanks to Sean and Tom. Um, uh, you may be wondering why a Zimbabwean uh, writing about uh, a coup in Africa is doing on a stage in Winchester, Virginia. Um, I live across the mountain in, uh, in Waterford in Loudoun County. Um, I met Sean through uh, mutual friends. Um, I've lived in the States. I was born and raised in Zimbabwe. Um, I've lived in the US since 2003 and in Virginia since uh, 2012. Um, and this is my second book about Zimbabwe. Um, this story um, is, it started actually in Virginia. Uh, um, two, two years ago in November of 2017, I took a road trip with, um, with three friends, two of whom are Zimbabwean stroke uh, ex-Rhodesians who live in Virginia in the Charlottesville area. And I'm, in 2017, I'm 48 years old, 49 years old. I'm married with two kids in midlife crisis. Um, and I tell my friends I want to uh, go on a road trip. And I have another friend in Zimbabwe, I was born and raised in Zimbabwe, my family still live there. Um, my first book was about uh, the, I don't know if anyone knows about the politics of Zimbabwe in recent history, the land invasions in Zimbabwe, um, the expropriation of commercial farmlands, mostly white farmers. Um, so my parents, I wrote a memoir about my parents uh, on a farm in eastern Zimbabwe and the crazy things that they did to keep hold of their property under the uh, dictatorship of Robert Mugabe. Um, unlike most books about Africa, I'm sure you read the news about Africa, um, it was actually a comedy, um, a dark comedy, because most things you read about Africa are depressing, but if you go there, it's actually not very depressing. It's kind of inspiring in many ways, and people find humor and um, uh, laughter, comedy, in the worst situations. Um, I actually set out to write this travel book then, um, 
with my two friends about this road trip. Um, and it was going to be a book about three guys, four guys actually, because the fourth guy was in Zimbabwe, four guys in midlife crisis on a road trip through Mozambique, which is a neighboring country to Zimbabwe. My family live, um, I grew up on the eastern border of Zimbabwe with Mozambique. Um, and we set off on this road trip in a, um, in a vintage 1970 Mercedes-Benz 280SE, um, which our Zimbabwean friend, a guy called John Kerr, is a famous mechanic. He, owned this, uh, he owns all these vintage cars. We were supposed to go in his Land Cruiser, but he had, had to lease it out to earn a bit of rent money. So we traveled in this vintage Mercedes-Benz, and we obviously landed in Zimbabwe first, my home country, and the country's in, in a mess. It's the 37th year of one-party rule. Robert Mugabe um, is the, has been the one leader of Zimbabwe since 1980 in independence. Um, and I didn't want to stay in Zimbabwe. I didn't want to write about it. It depresses me. Um, I'd already written about it. I was interested in writing about Mozambique and us four guys on a road trip. And it was going to be like um, the hangover uh, set, in, set in Latin Africa. Um, so we set off on this trip, and three days into it, in driving this Mercedes-Benz, we, we heard from back from Zimbabwe via WhatsApp messages and Facebook that the president had fired the vice president of the country. Uh, the president, obviously, is Robert Mugabe. The vice president is a man ma named Emerson Mnangagwa, uh, who was also nicknamed the Crocodile, and had been um, his sort of right-hand man, henchman, hitman, many people say, for about 50 years, but 37 years in government in Zimbabwe uh, as Mugabe's right-hand man. But by 19, by, sorry, by 2017, Mugabe, Mugabe's wife, a woman called Grace Mugabe, very glamorous, um, sort of Imelda Marcos, uh, Eva Peron figure in, in Africa, was angling to take power from her husband. Okay, so we're driving on this road. We're on this road trip, and we hear the news that Mugabe has fired his his ally and vice president, um, who's now gone on the run for his life, and he's gone on the run, uh, trying to escape Zimbabwe via Mozambique. And we're living in Mozambique, we're traveling in Mozambique, and we sort of wonder, um, well, this is the end of his career. If he's not dead, he might turn up in the guest house that we're staying in. Um, but what we all knew was that Grace Mugabe would take power in Zimbabwe, and it would be a continuation of what's happened for the previous 37 years, probably worse, okay? Um, about six or seven days in um, to, the, uh, to our journey, we heard that the vice president, again, the crocodile, had arrived uh, in exile, landed in exile in Johannesburg in South Africa, and was claiming that uh, he'll be back in Zimbabwe in two weeks to take power. Um, and we all just laughed at this. It, it was a complete joke. Um, no one who flees a country has any kind of power base, and Mugabe's a very powerful man, his wife is a very powerful woman, and there was no way that this guy's ever coming back. But anyway, we sort of joked and laughed about it. Um, about two days after that, um, we heard, again, via WhatsApp messages, uh, something that might surprise you is that you, in Africa and even the worst sort of poverty-stricken countries, the technology is highly sophisticated. Uh, you get four, 3G, 4G uh, internet con or Wi-Fi connections, and you, you can see every news feed on your phone, and you can get friends. will WhatsApp you instantly and tell you things that are happening. More quickly, you'll find out more quickly from a neighbor or a friend or someone living in the country than you will from any mainstream media source. Um, what we learned about a week into our trip was that the, the general of the armed forces in Zimbabwe um, had returned to the country, and he's an ally of the crocodile, the vice president, and he was laying down the law to, um, to uh, Mugabe, the president, and he's saying, you can't fire my comrade, uh, the vice president, like this, um, and if this continues, we're going to sort you out. Um, and the Zimbabwe military is very powerful. Uh, the, the head of the armed forces, this guy Konstantino Chiwenge, is not to be messed with. Um, and when he gives a threat like that, uh, you've got to listen. And my friends and I, we were now 10 days into our hangover road trip, having a fun time. I'm a journalist, I'm a travel writer, one of my friends is a photojournalist. We both looked at each other and we said, like, shit is going to kick off in Zimbabwe, we've got to be there. And um, my other two friends who aren't journalists um, would prefer to have a fun holiday, kind of rolled their eyes and said, oh God, do we have to do this? But we drove back, we raced back to Zimbabwe. And we got there um, about two days after the military had staged what I call in the book the perfect coup. A military coup in which they removed Mugabe, uh, 
uh, sorry, they, they, they removed the allies of Mugabe's wife, but they kept Mugabe and his wife in power. Okay, and this is very confusing at the time, and we wondered, why is he doing this? Um, a couple of days later, there was a mass march where the people rose up and said, we, uh, we all, everyone wants to get rid of Robert, uh, Mugabe. Um, a demonstration of a protest of about a million people on the streets, we were there for that. Um, and two days later, sure enough, Mugabe resigned, and the crocodile in Johannesburg returned to Harare as the president, the new president, exactly two weeks after he said that this is what he is going to do. And I watched this and I said, I've never seen anything like this. What on earth has just happened? And I went back to the States, I wrote a magazine article about it, and I pitched this book to my publisher saying, I want to write a book about four guys on this road trip who get caught up, who are looking for adventure and excitement in their boring lives. And um, I want to uh, key on at the end the story about a military coup um, in which I was sort of part of, uh, a witness, um, and I want to um, finish the book about this adventure. Okay? So they said, um, fine, go and write the book. And I went back to Zimbabwe and I knew one way to write the book. The only way to write the book was to actually speak to the military. And I kept find out how they had carried out this, uh, the coup. Um, and no one in the Zimbabwe military speaks. Because even though uh, I, I equate it in the book to the raid on Entebbe or Zero Dark Thirty, the, the, the special forces raid to get Bin Laden, this was the most precise, sophisticated military operation, certainly in Zimbabwean history, possibly in Southern African history, um, how they had carried this operation out. Uh, and I wanted to speak to them about it, but none of them would speak. Um, and I'm trying to write a book, I have a tight deadline, and my book is pointless at this point. And then I make a call to a friend of my father's who lives in Zimbabwe, he's a businessman, he's fairly, fairly well connected, and I say to him, do you know anyone in the military who'll speak to me? And he goes, no, I don't, none of them will speak to you, but I do know someone who has a story about the coup. And I said, who is it? And he sent me a text message with a phone number on it and a first name, and the name was Tom, and a cell phone number in South Africa. And I said, who is this? And he wouldn't reply. The following day, I'm back in Harare, asking questions again, as the journalist should, and again, I ask, I meet someone completely different and unconnected, um, and I ask him the same question. And this guy is a black political activist who's just returned to Harare from exile in South Africa since the, uh, the removal of Mugabe. And I said to him, do you know anyone in the military who will speak? And he said, no, they're not going to speak to you, but I do know someone who has a story to tell. And he gave me a phone number and a, and a name, and the name was Ellis. And I looked at the number I'd been given the previous day, and it was the same number. <laughs> and his name was Tom Ellis. And I made a call the following day to a guy, a white businessman in South Africa. <coughs> and I said, I've been giving you a number. And he said, well, I've, I was expecting your call. I'd read your previous book, a comedy about your parents. And I really liked it. Do you want to write a book about the coup? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, well, let me tell you what happened. And he proceeded to tell me the story that was so outrageous that I thought it was just total bullshit. Um, and it began with the story about how he, had, uh, he was a political activist who always wanted to get rid of Mugabe and how he, um, had, an assassin had been sent to kill him. Mugabe had sent an assassin to kill him. Instead of killing him, they ended up drinking together and over six months formed a partnership. Um, and and, and they, their goal was to overthrow Mugabe and install the crocodile as the president. And obviously I thought it was bullshit, um, but I began to meet members of this team that he had put together and that's what the book is about. That's the introduction I've told you. And the story is about these guys and the crazy adventure that they had and uh, extrapolating from that the adventure I got caught up in reporting it. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Thanks. Tom. I hope I haven't taken too much time. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Douglas. It's great to be on the panel with you. And Sean, thank you for having us here in Winchester today. And um, thanks to everybody who came out. Um, one thing that Jill had said on the previous panel about um, how we're all, uh, how so many of us feel we're all students first, and I think that's really a big part of whether you uh, appreciate uh, appreciate uh, writing or uh, practice writing or, or doing both, and I think that's uh, a big part of my motivation, uh, and I think it's kind of increased over the years that uh, being in a learning environment to be able to leave my journalism job and have a fellowship for a period of time, uh, go return to college and get enrolled in a writing program at 
felt like being a student first uh, led me to be able to complete this, uh, complete this work. Um, I was the editor in charge of the coverage of the Virginia Tech shootings uh, in 2007 for the Richmond Times-Dispatch. I got to Blacksburg at about 4 o'clock the afternoon after the morning the shootings took place and spent the next few days there. Uh, we edited the stories, I edited the stories there, and they were sent to uh, Richmond. Um, over, a, as you can imagine, for uh, any of us who were there during that time, journalists uh, covering this tragedy, uh, it left uh, just a, a profound, indelible impression. Uh, I returned to Richmond. Uh, I really thought, perhaps naively, that uh, out of this uh, tragedy, uh, there could be that there could be some move to address the problems of gun violence in the United States, um, problems that the state and the nation had really struggled with over a period of time. Um, it, it was a, how many of y'all were here in Virginia when that happened, when Virginia Tech happened, right? And so you remember like the outpouring of support and uh, how much empathy there was for the Virginia Tech community. Um, and so over the next three, three years, from 2007 to 2010, uh, it was always kind of in the back of my mind uh, whether I could write something about this or, mm -hmm. and, and, how, and how I would approach it. And in 2010, uh, I, I, I made up my mind that I wanted to uh, research this as a book and try to tell the story uh, th uh, through the experiences of uh, survivors and their supporters in the community. Um, but I also became aware at that time of uh, this really awful backdrop, I think, that was taking place politically uh, in Virginia and across the, the nation. And in 2010, I went to the three-year memorial service in, in Blacksburg, and then um, three days later, um, there was uh, a huge gun rights rally uh, in Northern Virginia. Um, stopped at two places and then it went across the river to the National Mall in Washington and uh, it just struck me as uh, uh, it just struck me at what a divide there was how a state that could uh, mourn uh, these deaths so much and have such empathy uh, could also be in a, in a frozen over its inability to do anything because of this, uh, the gun debate in our country and of course, gun rights at that time had uh, greatly expanded as a result of the Heller decision in uh, 2008. So in, so in 2010, I set out to write this book thinking initially uh, it would be a book about the, about the gun debate primarily. Uh, and as I met more people uh, who were involved, uh, survivors, uh, their supporters in the community, um, I expanded it to include the topics of, of safety and healing, which uh, are, are so important aftermath of the tragedies. So for a period of about a decade, um, I got to know some of the survivors, uh, some of the families, uh, their supporters in the community, um, and tried to follow their um, advocacy um, and how and what they were doing in the decade that uh, followed the aftermath, followed the shootings. Uh, people in my book include uh, students uh, who were shot and survived and became gun safety advocates, um, Colin Goddard, uh, John Woods, uh, Christina Anderson, who was shot and survived, and she became a, a safety advocate, safe communities, uh, safe campuses, and has also become a person who's a, uh, a connector. She's uh, worked to um, connect people, uh, different survivor communities, and, um, and, they, and they, how they support one another, learn one another, it's been a complete revelation to be an honor to be a kind of privy to some of these uh, communities and how they bond and support one another. Uh, I did a talk with Christina earlier this year at the uh, National Press Club and uh, through her outreach we had survivors there from uh, the Navy Yard shootings, the Virginia Tech uh, shootings, and from the Alexandria uh, congressional baseball team attack. And when you stop and think about those three tragedies and, and, uh, and then uh, 
also recall the most recent shootings in Virginia Beach, uh, the uh, on-the-air murders of the WDBJ television journalists in Roanoke. Um, we have ample, ample nearby uh, reasons that we all should be concerned about this, uh, about this topic and about what the survivors have gone through. Uh, Douglas had mentioned um, the social media and the increase in the ability to communicate, and that's very much a part. That's one thing that our that our books and our that our books and our histories uh, have in common. Uh, toward the end of my book, um, I reflect on uh, the, I reflect on the Marjorie Stone and Douglas students and the great energy they brought to the uh, debate, and many of the, some of the Virginia Tech um, graduates in the book comment on how um, all those tools, social media tools, uh, were, were very much in their infancy at, at that time in, in 2007. Um, and on the negative side of, of the uh, great changes in uh, technology, you all may have heard just in the past week, uh, Andy Parker, who's the father of uh, Allison Parker, one of the WDBJ journalists, uh, he testified on Capitol Hill um, in his continuing effort to have to have uh, social media networks take down the murder, the video of the murder of his daughter, which is still which is still visible, uh, which is still visible online. Uh, he spoke at the same congressional hearing recently as the, the tech uh, corporation uh, executives uh, spoke at. Um, so um, that's a little bit about my background. Could which I would like to read just a short. A short portion, um, and um, so this is about this is about Colin Goddard, who was uh, who was shot four times in the French class and and survived, and it's uh, it catches up with Colin at the uh, catches up with Colin as he's uh, returned to college this time at the University of Maryland and uh, gone back to get a, a graduate degree. Though Colin Goddard had planned a hard stop from advocacy after entering graduate school, he kept his hand in and made several media appearances after the Parkland shootings, maintaining close ties with every town for gun safety. But in his second semester at Maryland, weeks before the 10th anniversary memorial observance at Blacksburg, Goddard was faced with a medical crisis that returned him to April 16, 2007. In January of 2017, Goddard's mother had sent him an article about a recent report by the Centers for Disease Control on elevated blood level, blood lead levels among gunshot victims who had retained bullet fragments. She asked him if he'd ever had a test for lead poisoning. Goddard said he'd never been warned that the fragments could carry the threat of lead poisoning and arranged to be tested as soon as possible. The results were startlingly high. Goddard said that if his had been a case of occupational exposure to lead, the levels were almost to the point where doctors would have recommended that the person not return to the workplace. He set out on a months long series of doctor's appointments and examinations to determine the best possible course. It was very much on his mind as he attended the memorial events in Blacksburg and back home in Maryland as he assessed this threat just more than a decade since recovering from being shot in the French class. Goddard searched his own memory and combed medical records as he tried to retrace his history. He believed that the fragments weren't thought to be a problem as long as they weren't in joints where they can do the most harm. But he was also told that over time, doctors had come to new theories about how fragments can travel in the body and the risks that they pose. Goddard underwent an invasive surgery in September 2017, which he described as similar to a hip replacement, but with doctors instead focusing on clearing fragments from the joint area. He'd emerged from surgery facing, in many ways, some of the same challenges as when he was shot. He called it a months and months process, very similar to the kind of process that happened after Blacksburg. That would mean a wheelchair first, then a walker, crutches, and a cane. Recovering from the shootings, Goddard in 2007 was determined to heal in time for a scheduled volunteer service in Madagascar. This time, he was on track for a January university trip to India with fellow MBA students. He made the trip and went on to graduate in May. 
but the recovery continued to present uncertainties. After seeing his lead level drop and go up, Goddard talked with more doctors and experts before starting a naturopathic chelation therapy to excrete the toxic substance. Goddard said further surgery wasn't a practical option, and he worried that, quote, waiting for symptoms to occur means I'm waiting for damage to happen. In 2018, Goddard was continuing to evaluate results before deciding his next steps. Goddard also considered if it was possible to play a role in further study on the dangers of fragments, perhaps involving other, other shooting survivors he's met over the years. In the short term, troubling questions about lead poisoning would persist. Doctors asked him at one point whether he was fatigued or noticed a lack of concentration. With a young family and studying to complete a graduate program, Goddard said how could he be sure that any fatigue would be out of the ordinary? Was it possible that more serious symptoms would present later? He said, you think you put a lot of this stuff behind you. You think you've overcome and moved on. And fine, this pulls you right back down and still affecting you in a physical, direct way. It's kind of crazy. Colin um, yeah, looks fantastic, um, and he's fit, um, tall person, and uh, now is very much ten years after the shootings, uh, facing another uh, facing another health crisis. Um, and I don't want any I don't want y'all think that my book is uh, sad because I think what people have gone on to do is um, brave and inspirational. Now that we've got some renewed interest, I think, in these topics, that uh, uh, I'd like for readers to look at this book as showing uh, what some of the tech families and survivors did and how their work over the uh, past 10 years may have helped crack the door open to some, some reforms yet. Thanks to, thanks to you both for sharing that. Um, so my first thought is this came up in the first panel and I have repeated it, I probably will say it at everything I speak at, this, this notion of we live in a time where information and the access of, of free information has never been more readily available, but it poses the risk of not only competition for eyeballs, but the influx of bad information, the influx of uh, competing narratives. I first want to salute you both for, for doing the, the real heavy lifting of writing book-length work um, I think what your excerpt in particular, I'm glad you read that piece, because to me it puts in sharp relief why these books and why long-form journalism is critical, because in our Facebook, social media age, no matter how passionate or knowledgeable you are on a subject, it's a 140-character soundbite, um, and you, with an issue like gun safety or violence, you probably don't get past the talking points, and somebody that maybe is radically pro Second Amendment might read that section and say, this is at best more complicated than I thought it was. So I'd love you both to speak about perhaps why you, as, as two writers with tremendous experience with short form journalism, the shift to long form and, and perhaps why not only was it important to you, but you felt for the message um, of, of these books, it needed to be a book as opposed to an essay or you know, a series of smaller pieces. Thanks, Jordan. Um, that, that's a really great question. Um, but one of the central themes of my book and what happened in Zimbabwe um, relates to um, narrative and media and social media and what is perception and what people uh, I, I, I was reading a comment recently, it's like in America we're living in two different movies. Half the country are watching one movie, the other half are watching a completely different movie, and no one speaks to each other about it. Um, I think that's very accurate, um, and it's because we live in our, these silos. We all read what we want to read, and social media allows you to curate um, for yourself, you know, and your own view. Um, I'm going to relate it to Zimbabwe, because I think the, the, the way that my book um, transcends this, just a story about a, a, a story about a coup in Africa, is that what happened in Zimbabwe over those two weeks, which I've described to you, um, the, 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 the story was about a military coup, but really what happened was how in order to carry out a coup successfully, I mean, you may not know this, but it's very, very hard to, in, even in Africa, 
in a modern world to be to uh, carry out a military coup like happened in the 60s and 70s and 80s in the Cold War. That happened all the time, okay? But now, in the 21st century, there are laws in place. Uh, the UN has laws, international governments have laws, South Afri Africa has the African Union, Southern Africa has what's called SADC, the Southern African Development Community, and you can't just go in and remove a government even one as corrupt and authoritarian as the Zimbabwe government or as Robert Mugabe. You can't actually do that. Um, there was a coup in Gabon about three months ago. It failed because it had no legitimacy. Okay? There have been coups, uh, I don't know if any of you know, know about the Wonga coup in Equatorial Guinea, um, which was a crazy bunch of um, uh, British aristocrats teamed up with uh, mercenaries in South Africa and try to overthrow the government of this oil-rich country, Equatorial Guinea. They failed because the Zimbabwean they were with, they were thought was on their side, informed them, basically. Um, there's, there was another coup, I think, in um, somewhere in West Africa a few years ago, and it succeeded militarily, but the US and Nigeria, which was the neighboring country, rejected it, which meant they couldn't carry it out. It wasn't, uh, they couldn't succeed. So what happened in Zimbabwe, it, which is an amazing story about what they carried, off, carried out and pulled off, was that they set about carrying out a coup that was not a coup. You can't overthrow a government. Okay? I mentioned in my introduction that they, the military special forces intervened one night in Zimbabwe and they removed the loyalists to Robert Mugabe's wife, Grace. Okay? Um, they arrested them or they forced them to flee the country. But the very next morning they went on television, the military general, went to television and he said, everything is fine, the situation is returned to normal and President Mugabe is still the president and we're protecting him. So if you wanted Mugabe to, to be overthrown and you were celebrating his coup, you looked at that and you, you thought, what the hell is this about? Like, what's the point, okay? But these guys had thought ahead to all this. They'd already known, having observed coups previously in Africa, having been part of military operations to quell military coups in Africa, they knew that in order to get legitimacy, you can't actually just overthrow uh, a, a, a president. What they needed was to get the people on side to express their will that they wanted to get rid of the president. Okay? So what they did is that they removed their allies to the president's wife, they kept the president in power, they then um, conducted a social media campaign using allies that had been put together by this team that I told you about, <coughs> Johannesburg, this guy Tom Ellis, I call him, and his assassin Casper, who teamed up with members of the ruling party who wanted to get rid of Mugabe. They based themselves in exile in Johannesburg uh, for about a year. And when the military operation took place, they then stepped, they then, uh, like Ocean's Eleven, they all had roles to do. Their goal was, right, um, some of us know diplomats and ambassadors in Africa and around the world. We are now going to communicate with them. And we're going to tell them that this is not a coup. And these guys would call the Chinese. One of, them, uh, one of the main plotters was a former ambassador to China. A very brilliant man called Christopher Muchangwa. Um, he could speak Chinese. He'd speak, he'd speak to the Chinese government. He said, this is not a coup. Um, we're, re we're restoring order. Um, there has been a coup, but the coup was uh, carried out by Grace Mugabe, the president's wife. This is all, this is all normal. Um, others had connections to the US government, to the British government, who were very uh, instrumental in this. And they said the same thing. They said, no, this is not a military coup, definitely not a military coup. Um, and you'll see, because the people will express their will. And they had, they literally had 36 hours. They were given a timeline by the president of South Africa, who then was a guy called Jacob Zuma, who headed what was the South Af Southern African Development Community, SADC, who were very important for the UN and the international community. And he said to them, this is a military coup, unless you can show us that the people are in favor of it. So how, even in a country like Zimbabwe, how do you get people to, um, in the, in the space of 36 hours, um, get people to express their approval for a removal of a president. And you use your networks, you use social media. And within 36 hours, this team based in South Africa had got a million people on the streets of Zimbabwe. 
They had also, uh, the military had commandeered the airport, uh, Harare Airport. No one knew this. This is all undercover. Everyone thinks, doesn't really know what's, the people don't really know what's going on. But in securing the airport, they then invited the world's media into Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe has very draconian press laws and has kicked out journalists from every international media organization. The BBC were banned for a while. I think CNN was banned for a while. And overnight, they said, you're all welcome. Come on in. And the media were there to report on what was this extraordinary march of a million people on the streets of Zimbabwe. And at the same time, everyone in Zimbabwe has a cell phone. Everyone at this march has a cell phone. And they're tweeting this, and they're Facebooking it, and they're YouTubing it, um, and mostly WhatsApp. For some reason, <coughs> WhatsApp is not the biggest thing in America, but it's the biggest thing in Africa. It's an uh, encrypt encrypted messaging service, far better than texting or emailing. Um, it's encrypted. Encryption is very important because you don't get spy. You, the Zimbabwe government spies on everyone, but with WhatsApp, you don't. You can't do that. So these networks got into place and got one million people onto the streets, and the world's media, in 36 hours, reported it all. And by within 48 hours, the president of Zimbabwe had seen which way this was going, and through a bit of other coercion, which I bring out out of the book, uh, resigned. Um, but it relates to this, uh, the story that we're seeing in America, we're seeing it in Europe, is narrative is everything. Even in Africa, under authoritarian government, narrative is so important, and you have to control that narrative. If you control the narrative, uh, you win. There's um, a postscript to all this, coup happened November 2017, how long ago is that? A year and a half, a year and a half ago. It's very fun to control the narrative, okay, and the spin. But the Zimbabwe, the new government under the crocodile has not delivered the goods, okay? Things are just as bad under the new government. Um, and the lesson is that it's fine to control the narrative, it's fine short term to, uh, uh, to win on social media, but if you actually don't deliver anything for people, you will probably either be removed by a coup or you will fail and your government won't improve the lives of anyone. Um, but again, so it's, I, it, this relates to the two movies we're all seeing. I see this now in Zimbabwe. Oh, there's one more post, a little postscript as well. There was an election in Zimbabwe about eight months after. I, I mentioned this to Shaw. I think I mentioned it to you when we met. There was an election in Zimbabwe eight months after the coup in which um, all the media were invited in. Um, but Zimbabwe, it turned out, is divided in the same way as the United States. And I think a lot of Europe is the same. A lot of African countries are probably similar. In cities where educated people have access to social media, um, they all supported the opposition party. So on social media, the media saw how the opposition party was so popular and could fill a stadium with 50,000, 60,000 people. And the government under the crocodile had desultory crowds, hardly anyone turning up. So they thought they were going to win the election. What actually is the more closer to the reality is that most of the country are not on social media. They're living in rural parts of the country where they don't have access to the media, they don't spend their time on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, and they vote differently. And I think this is a correlation to what happened in, in the US in 2016, is that we're all watching one movie, but half the country are living in another movie, and you don't speak to them, you're not hearing from them. And this was the shock for many Zimbabweans was that half the country actually wanted the crocodile who carried out the coup. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, I hope I haven't gone on, but it's a very, uh, parallels exist in this sort of modern technological age, the digital age that we're living in. Yeah, um, I, uh, my own kind of entering to writing this book was really from an opposite, opposite world of writing at that time when I really started working on this, I was the breaking news editor of the Times Dispatch. I'd gone from a, a job where I edited long stories and, and in-depth coverage, you know, stories that were thousands of words, to uh, going in really early in the morning and chasing every conceivable uh, bit of news and mishap and weather that happened in, in Richmond as the newspaper was kind of struggling with the idea of how to advance itself in the digital world. I'd had a lot of experience prior working at a wire service where everything is very much uh, done very immediately. And while I was 
on this job, I really kind of, as Douglas says, you're fa you can be fascinated by narrative even in the shortest form. And I guess uh, while I was in this job, I was, became very hyper-attuned because you need something to <laughs> think about at 5 o'clock in the morning. But I became hyper-attuned to the notion of how even with very short stories and sentences and paragraphs are building blocks that can be uh, that can be elaborated on and, and that can become narrative and that you can start from a single sentence and, and, and grow it into a, make it grow into a, a longer story. And so I really tried to uh, I've tried to I try to use that as a as a kind of positive way of working through a job that could be very unpleasant, but at the same time, it, it opened up in me the idea of trying to write something longer, uh, trying to write something longer on my own. And that's how I came. That's how I came into this, and then it was very interested to find out that uh, as I was reporting it and as time moved on, that the very things that I was doing on the job. Uh, really were changing and also changed what people's impressions were and how they how they how they consume how they consume news so yeah so I went from the I went from the opposite I was doing writing very short writing very short stories editing very short stories and and then decided to immerse myself in a longer piece so I'm going to bounce this back to you Tom I think one of the one of the things which I, I recommend both these books highly um, one of the things, because I, I, I'm a political animal, uh, I've got my own, you know, feelings. I, I think and I think everyone would bemoan violence and death. So again, that, speaking of narrative, I think what your book brilliantly does is, is truly complicates, and it's a necessary complication, the soundbite culture around hot button political issues. And one of the things, even though I, I consider myself relatively well informed. I had a series of epiphanies reading your book in, in terms of complicating the narrative. It occurred to me, what if we were to approach gun violence in other ways? So the, the example of the lead poisoning is certainly a very uh, compelling one, but yet that still only affects a certain amount of people. One of the statistics you bring up in the book is the, the cost all of us as taxpayers assume for the medical bills of violence and gun-related violence. And it occurred to me while I was reading the book, and I'd love you to elaborate a little bit, because you do this a lot throughout, but if we were to frame, and certainly not in an actual political debate, but just in daily conversation, if we were to frame the issue of, of gun violence in terms of how much it costs every American citizen, regardless of your political views, that's a different way of looking at gun rights or police or, right, this is a, and that's an issue that in other political arenas, it always comes down to dollars and cents. So yeah, that's that's. that's a, I'm so glad you brought that up because in the recent, you know, we had the failed General Assembly special session on, on gun safety legislation, and there is so much uh, good work being done on uh, examining gun violence as a as a health problem. Um, you know, Johns Hopkins researchers, uh, for example, Duke University, other places where they've really dug into. Uh, statistics about how states that have more stringent laws about uh, gun owners uh, uh, locking up their weapons and protecting, keeping them from children, that those those places do have fewer deaths, child deaths, accidental deaths by guns. Uh, the uh, Marcus Martin, who's a vice president of the University of Virginia and was Governor Kane's uh, vice chairman of the review panel, uh, Gerald Massengill is the chairman. Marcus Martin. Uh, told me that he had, and he's an expert on emergency medicine and was head of that department before he became vice president at the university. Uh, he told me that he had treated uh, probably hundreds of gunshot victims uh, in his career as a, in his career as a practicing physician and, and related how uh, this is like the highest level of care, high high level care, very costly, uses all of the techniques needed to. Uh, to save to save lives, um, and you know none of this is, has come up at all in, since the Virginia Beach uh, Virginia Beach shootings, and that and that's I think that's a frustration. There's a lot of good scholarship out there about all of these um, different ways of looking at this of looking at this issue and why improvements are so important. Uh, one thing I mentioned in the book is that. Uh, 
when um, President Lyndon Johnson created the forerunner of the National Highway Traffic Safety Commission, um, he selected an epidemiologist for that for that job. It was someone who was, uh, uh, came from the health field, and uh, they very much looked at automobile safety as a health problem. What kind of injuries were taking place? How could those injuries be? Uh, how could those injuries be prevented? Uh, and uh, it was great. I think it's a great model or model, but an example of how that was done, how that was done in the past. So uh, I think a special session could have possibly brought out some of these things. But I, I, I didn't read a whole lot about uh, people talking about the health issue, for example. And 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 then we're not just talking about mass shootings, but also shootings in neighborhoods, uh, uh, suicides. We've had an uptick and up increase in the number of suicides in our country. Um, these are all deaths that could be reduced with uh, gun safety legislation and uh, gun safety legislation and awareness. And I think it has to be kind of a, you know complete a complete package. But when it's but when it's reduced to uh, uh, allegations that people want their guns, they're going to take my guns away, and it's all a mental health it's all a mental health problem. Um, when it's just reduced to those points, it just really omits so much uh, information, good information and scholarship that's out there. And what I found is that survivors, uh, advocates, they are really well versed on what some of these techniques and what the new, uh, what the new thinking is. I spoke to uh, the League of Women Voters at Southampton Roads in Norfolk uh, a couple of weeks before, the, between the shootings in Virginia Beach and the special session. And they were so up to date on all the different facets of the issue uh, and the legislation. And I think it shows that people at the community level are, again, this is uh, a field where they're ahead of their elected representatives, I think. So I, I seldom miss an opportunity to bring up one of my favorite quotes by George Orwell. I think it pertains, it's speaking of narrative and, and storytelling, Orwell wrote, uh, the idea that art should be without politics is itself a political opinion. And I think it's important to keep that in mind that no matter how well the story is told or how much reporting is done or how much money is thrown at it, there's, there's big moneyed interests in whatever the competing narrative is, especially as it pertains to health. Um, I see uh, my friend Ronnie Citron Fink is, is here. She's written a book about um, hair dye and how hair dye, in addition to having some serious medical repercussions for people that use it, there's a tremendous lobby that, that, that yeah. propels that. So none of these things exist in a vacuum. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. I definitely want to make sure if there's any questions we have a chance to hear from, uh, from the audience. I have a question. Um, you talked about the no, he uh, declined a request for an interview. Uh, he declined a request for an interview before he died. Uh, I would, I would like to have spoken with him. Yes. He's, I'm sorry. He and he's the, he was the president of Virginia Tech uh, at the time of the shootings. Yeah, question for both of you guys. Um, the two people you're writing, this long form journalism, an entire book about an issue that might have. So that's a great question, and it's something I'm, I wrestled with in, in this book. Um, the nature of my, well, I, fi I found these characters who no one knew about, who helped carry out this successful coup, and I found them amazing, heroic, brave, crazy, just powerful characters um, from different sides of the political spectrum, um, but I think I mentioned Ocean's Eleven. These guys were like a dirty dozen Ocean's Eleven team that came together. In doing that, I obviously elevate them to, uh, I obviously, I'm in favor of them, which means I'm in favor of the coup in a way. So I had to balance my uh, telling a heroic story about them 
with this idea of what they're doing is actually illegal and the consequences of it might not be good and 18 months later haven't been good. So it's a really good, great question and I, I struggled with this and the way I think I try to get, a, I, I got around it by, in two ways. One, I told the other side as much as possible, the guys who had been removed by the coup, um, several of whom were in exile, living in fear, very angry, and I spent months talking to one of them, who hates me as a result of the book, but I did get him to speak to me and I did my best to tell his side of the story. Um, the other thing that I did, I did two other things. The other thing was um, I tried to tell the story about characters and personalities as opposed to politicians. Um, and you can tell the flaws of a person if you do that. And so although I'm maybe elevating these guys, I can also say, you know what, like, um, you're a flawed character. You, what you're doing might be a mistake. Or oh, you use, uh, as much as possible, this is the thing that, um, it sort of relates to trying to tell a different story about uh, gun violence, is in Africa, everyone has a sad story, and everyone, the media report, uh, it's constant tragedy and starvation and war. But actually, Africa's not like that. And it's very funny. And people have great sense of humor, dark sense of humor. And I, I use as much as possible of that humor to tell uh, a story about bad people. Um, but they're all great characters. So the villains in my story have got the best lines. Um, and uh, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, another sort of parallel I try to make in, in the book is um, with Game of Thrones. Um, because uh, my sister actually who lives in Harare uh, lives near the general and lives near the house of Mugabe and when the military intervened it's just explosions all night around her she doesn't know what's going on but she knows the military are stepping in and um, stuff is going down and she whatsapped at me in Mozambique saying we don't we don't watch Game of Thrones we live it <laughs> and when I was researching the book, I said this to one of the political characters. I said, like, I look at Zimbabwe politics, which actually bores me a bit. Like, these guys are all corrupt. Both sides are. Every faction is corrupt. Um, none of them have great ideas. They all want power. But if you speak to them, they're the most amazing characters. They're funny. They're clever. They're smart. Um, and I said to him, like, Zimbabwe politics reminds me of Game of Thrones. And he shrugged and he went, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, thanks for your question. That, that's something that I faced. Uh, you know, I came into this book uh, looking at people who had, you know, suffered, uh, who had suffered through uh, mass shootings um, and wanted to tell their story of advocating for reforms. Uh, but at the same time, it's important to recognize that it, it, it is a complex topic. Uh, I did interview uh, in the book um, uh, two Virginia Tech graduates who uh, take quite the opposite view. Um, uh, one who was, uh, became involved in a, uh, became a, identified as a supporter of concealed campus carry at the University of Texas, uh, which took, uh, became law there in 2016, uh, and also someone who was involved in that effort at Virginia Tech uh, shortly after, uh, shortly after the shootings, and um, I felt like their views were important, not because um, necessarily just because they had the opposite uh, view from uh, other people who I was interviewing, but because they were part of the tech community and had gone and had, and had gone in a different path. And both of them asked me, um, "What kind of book are you writing?" And I told them, and I said. Uh, this is what I'm looking at. These are some of the things that I think about when I'm writing this book. So this may be a book that comes to opposite, this is going to be a book that I think might come to opposite conclusions of what your views are. And they were both very, um, they're, they're both very accepting of going forward with an, an interview. An, an interview. Any other? Yeah, I'll yes? My book came out in April. I've not had any, 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 any backlash. Yeah.
Wait, should I answer that as well? Um, sure. So I mentioned the one character I wrote about. Uh, uh, this is another thing about the social media age. Is, um, there's a former information minister uh, who was removed in the coup, who was Grace Mugabe's right-hand man, his Sven her Svengali, basically. He was removed by the coup. He's now in exile in, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and I spent a lot of time tracking him down. I knew I had to tell his story, but he's a very prominent media presence. He has a big support base in Zimbabwe. And he actually heard about me. I tried to track him down. He rejected all my office interview and then at some point he changed his mind and contacted me and we spent three months talking to each other and he eventually gave a making a documentary about the same subject and he eventually went on camera and gave an interview um, and when the book came out he despised it and he went on social media for two weeks underlining lines <laughs> saying uh, this is a Hollywood fiction okay um, and it's quite a nerve-wracking experience to be in the middle of a social media storm. I mean, it happens a lot to people who get um, caught up in Twitter wars, whatever it is, and you can have your career ruined. And it was a moment of extreme stress and anxiety. But what I, what I noticed was that he was just publicizing my book. And a friend of mine who knows him well said that's what he's actually doing. He loves confrontation as a public persona, but really, he's quite fine for your book to be out there. And he's doing your work for you. Um, the, the thing that's happened since, and again, like, he's calling this a fiction, and I'm nervous about people saying oh, it's a fiction. Uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, a, a radio DJ in Zimbabwe, a woman called Miss Red, who's this very glamorous, like, 25-year-old DJ, she tweeted about the book. Uh, saying like, uh, in Zimbabwe right now, they're all this, what's called load shedding, the power, power cuts, because the electricity grid doesn't work. So you live in darkness for 12 hours a day, um, where you don't have electricity for 12 hours a day, and people are reading the book. There's a digital bootleg copy going around, but there's also um, people reading it by candlelight. And she went on her radio show yesterday and tweeted about it, saying like, if you want to hear about what happened in the coup, this book is fantastic. And my Twitter feed has gone crazy. Uh, as a result, um, and uh, sort of relating to, I think, the political backlash is, I've had it from one side, but the other side, I wrote the book mostly for ordinary people who experienced the events like I did, and I think they're relating to that, is that it's a, it's a, it's a thriller, it's a, it's a story about characters, it's not overly political, and I think they're relating to it on that level, um, as opposed to on a political level. So, I, I think the key of a good panel is you, you want to leave them wanting more. Um, we're, we're at noon, um, but this is a good opportunity to, to buy the books. I, I don't think we've, we've, got to, we've got to move on. Um, so, please talk to the authors. They'll be signing their books later. Um, pick up a copy. Thank you. We're, we're going to move into uh, lunch. So, free lunch. Everyone with a pass, uh, please go get your lunch and we're gonna do a, for the next half hour, a screening of the Indie Skyline Film Fest. Thank you.